Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. We are on a journey to watch a film made by Daniel and Karen, who will join us after the screening. Um, please look forward to A Poetics for Transformation, which is a short documentary film made from the Festival Video Archives of Poetry Africa over the years, combined with animated illustrations, a call and response soundscape and photography. This film seeks to explore poetry's conscientizing capacity within the broader ecology of social justice. Through this film, we'll seek to harness how poetry can be linked to our universal cry for more justice, political, social, and economic by looking at how Poetry Africa performances spoke back to the underlying, underlying dynamics of the global hashtag movements. We hope that the film will introduce emerging poets to the positioning of their artistic practice that allows them to become integral to the realization of social justice. Our second hope is that this inspires other creatives to experiment by making content from our rich and underused arts archives. After the screening, we'll be back with a panel discussion with two of the filmmakers, Daniel Sheldon and Karen Ijumba. Join us now for the documentary and come back for a nice chat afterwards. Over the last decade and a half, global and local hashtag movements have been forged to expressly reject the falsehoods in social constructs and dominant narratives that are fed to society by people in positions of power, political leaders, and governments. At the core of all these movements is a call for a world that is more truthful and more just for a people that is more courageous and more filled with love and for grieving of the world that has been to make room for the pain and joy of the world that is to come. Poetry has, before and during these movements, served as a space and platform through which to name, interrogate, critique, and reimagine these constructs and narratives. Poetry invites us 
to engage with the deeper project of radical transformation. We are said to be living in and towards a post-racial society where words like rainbow nation and colorblind are frequently used to describe a supposed reconciliation of imagined and real racial difference. However, our lived reality presents a more complex truth. Let's say, let's say you identify with being labeled black. You feel a certain sense of pride of belonging when you ride or say it. You form judgment against society based on the idea that society has formed judgments against you. Black. Backward, brutes, behind, beggars, beyond blessed, blameful, boastful, but beautiful. Big black behind, big breasts, begging by Buandilo, big one, a black Benz, buys body, big bucks, big bills. Body beggars, business blossoms, but Bambobwana, Baba, Buanji Bajeti. Black bodies genuflect on sidewalks to a god that is all brimstone and fire. Their chorus, a hallelujah of bullets, a red sea deep enough for their mothers to swim in. They said he looked like a serial offender. There was too much Africa in his skin. Something about the way he walked screamed rape and pillage. The way he pulled that wallet quick out of his pocket, it might as well have been a bullet. Amadou Diallo, trigger warning. Saying you can't breathe and dying, lounging in your house and shot by someone who mistook your house for their house and dying. It's a boy being shot whilst picking a sunflower and dying. It's... Feel that silence how you please and still die. We tell their deaths like fairy tales. The way their skulls split across pavement. The way they cannot outrun a bullet. How can she say Jesus was a white man when he died the blackest way possible? With his hands up. With his mother watching. Makafula Villagas is 18 years old and has never seen a drop of high school blood. Makafula Villagas was born naked and suffering and designated to a high unemployment, high dark, high poplar squatter cap next to a cozy Jewish suburb. His uncle is unemployed, his father is a literate taxi driver, his girlfriend is illiterate and pregnant. His older brother was shot for a cavella dealer in front of Makafula Villagas with 12 old eyes. His aunt is in prison, va shoplifting, mother, daughter of a domestic worker who fell in love with a Tamara 1950s gangster. I would not judge Makafula Villagas, smiling and matizing at Tawengi Tekas. While my grandmother whispers tales of moving on, move on, my son, she keeps on saying, while paying rent in today's hot living, because in these streets, in these streets wounded by depression, perseverance is what it takes to survive the sharp blade of this ghetto, of this ghetto, of this overworked and underpaid ghetto, this ghetto of people trying to make a living and getting shut down, this ghetto, of this ghetto, of people who are meant to serve me and you, you're killing each and every one of us, this ghetto, this ghetto, I call home. Taxi fare war, guerrilla warfare tactics, urban jungle, JSEC hard life and fat beats. It's an adventure venturing down those black streets. Inner city kids have never felt the grass beneath their black feet. It's the 011, the 011, where you call 10 triple one and no one comes. I do not know how to celebrate this black that has left me in pieces, but maybe I am not to love it, but to survive it. I am every shade swallowed in the mouth of black because I am black. I must be black. I must be all black. Everything always full black must hold black close as blood will tender it. Dear as my own God-given name. In time, love us encyclopedic, catalog the survival in our spines, reference our pulse as grand centuries of footsteps, the tenacity to strive, the audacity of breath glow. And I swear, one day you will know that there is a sacred sermon in the tone of your skin. The way sun rays unashamedly sing their fellowship to your melanin, the music that molds brown hers and hymns reminds you that it has always been light which worships you as kin. I am the embodiment 
of my people. I'm a symbol of their strength and struggle. My feet freely raised from the north star to the south sent. I fight back to the world of racial dust. But Dimubaka have sent me to wipe the dirty floors of race, class, and poverty that my father left untouched. I am Steve Bantu Bigo's descendant. And I know it's not a sin to be born black. The myth of South African exceptionalism is that the democratic state is somehow a miracle, a rainbow nation that leads to cold. But it isn't a rainbow that leads to cold. It's a damp and dingy mine shaft hurtling away from safety in the surface. As a country, most of us know that we're well out of any rainbow nation dream. But I think while the economic and the poverty and the unemployment figures are what they are, we need to have more open and honest conversations about race, the function of racial privilege, the histories that have created the racial privilege. And once we've had those or st are starting those, we can have the conversations around how we remediate this. So for instance, I am reluctantly classified as colored. And I always am caught in the dilemma of whether to acknowledge that label which carries such painful apartheid memories for me, or to take up its longer history as a name for emancipated slaves, uh, which is part of my own history. So how do I signal all of those things? I think the real work that is done around race and, and transformation is done from a grassroots level and that the government is, is, is reacting the whole time as opposed to interacting. In the mid and latter part of the 20th century, fierce liberation struggles against colonialism were fought and supposedly won in Africa, Asia, and South America. However, when one begins to scratch the liberated surface of the post-colonial and post-apartheid state, one begins to question how free we all are. On green fertile soil they settled, built churches and erected crosses. They sold us milk from our cows, grain from our land, found diamonds in our mines and paid us to dig them up. We had grown used to picking up doors in the morning to turning our blood over and over in the sand. We were staying alive to bury each other. They threw nightmares at us and we caught them with our eyes. See, no war has ever been worn on knees. The ripped apart black skin is yet to be worn again. I once bet on my ancestors' graves. I don't want to be wrong again. And remember, remember that you have to die to be born again. Political theory, an introduction. If more blood had been shed to get out of oppression, less lives would be going down under liberation. Yeah. Bantu goes and lecture lips at the monkey parade. Fela says only a pervert would want any struggle to continue. Can we are from the struggle, we form the puzzle, reform this jungle, we hunt the hunters dry. Bartenders squeeze guitar strings to identify what we need to quench our savannah thirst, obsessed with the idea of being told you are free, bees. Yes, be easy, you are free like swarms, slums, are buzzing like pests, annoying the crap out of government, wanting to crush us citizens, feeding us poisonous isms with the aim of killing us in our sleep. Slowly drowning in township realities, chicken-minded crowned eagles lift till death under the forest canopy, wings clipped by destitution. Still, the people dance to the songs of the demagogue, waiting hands open, hoping that somehow broken promises would manifest. This hell, hemmed in, its forced geometry of concrete boils, spreads outwards, sidewards, in its rushes of sackcloth, of shack, of specification matchbox, to touch the stitchwork of hills, as near the docks, the boss drives by in his shepstone bends, as his boys, Look, they try your skull as cargo. Here, there, confined, where visions of heaven subsided long ago. For who 
I hear you say amnesia must fall precisely because South Africa is still South Africa. Amnesia must fall precisely because South Africa is not a Zania. The African child is victorious. Now the apartheid generation is getting nervous. They fear us. By Saba. They need the bus's permission. Now there's a breakdown in communication. The beautiful ones are born and we need an explanation. It's an abomination to idolize those who are part of your dehumanization. And though for now, her people still own our land, minerals, banks, and consumer industries, the new ideas are ours. She conquered the past, we own the future. There is nothing she can do to us anymore. Her survival will not be negotiated on her terms, and her grip will finally conform to the inevitable. It's only a matter of time. There are just too many of us. The rise of Rands and Rhodes excludes the majority of South Africans from discourse. One being a symbolic impediment to thinking about culture, lived experiences, and the other being a material impediment from taking part in spaces that allow discussion and discourse. So the idea of what genealogies, what knowledges we're drawing from and how those are violent, the ideas of how the spaces of the universities as they are built on um, histories of white supremacy and how they are violent and how we need to have an active um, dismantling, uh, an active undoing of these violent systems to um, arrive at any place that could be called freedom. It wasn't about the party, it was about the policy. And, and, that, and that, that placed politics in, in, in the correct framework that it had fallen out of, or seems to have fallen out of, where politics is not about personal, you know, professional gain. Politics is about policy, it's about people, and it's about problem solving. And uh, fees must fall and roads must fall. Swung that very much back into perspective. The fact of the feminist dimension of the struggle is the thing that will be, for me, its striking legacy, along with what it achieved in terms of coloniality and um, economic justice. Inequality is implicitly and explicitly woven into the fabric of society, and this is reflected across multiple status quos. Although varying public and private efforts are being made to work towards equality and equity, there is a further nuanced thing around the loud and silent ways in which violence is often used as a mechanism to maintain these status quos. Never mind the scattered bodies. How do we survive Marikana? How do the survivors survive? What democracy? Whose? Who does this nervous condition belong to? Are you still scared of the police? It was self-protection, said the police. It was the police said the union. It was the strikers, said Lonman. Nothing, said the dead miners. From speaking minds, we must get liberation, not death. Racing beyond fears for a loss so deep, I weep at your burial from the north, violence the robber black and white, and anger that you have gone chokes me in songless silence. O oh, miners and the 44 miners, killed in Marikana, I still hear your work song and fading and tearing the world and I pray you sing it till they in power tremble. Humanity has died in Marikana. The strike is over. The dead must return to work. <laughs> Down and out, amakwerekwere, those Nigerians, cockroaches and bums, drifters and hoarders.
the pattern, the prison, the plague, subproletariat underclass failure by market and the state stealing our women and stealing our jobs. And like my Nuga Lavaban, Banok Dina, Zotanak Kualiskanga, Vestrela, Banuga, damn lazy bastards. What are they doing here with their, my God is good, or oh, funny food and funny clothing? There's so many of them shit. Why don't they just go home? So I'm not going back to Africa, not today. That until I bag a foreign passport that bears my name, knits my soul to a wrinkled skin. If I have to, you won't catch me today. You won't crack my skull against your prison bars. My journey doesn't end in your detention camps. One, what we want, a place to cook. A place to cook and sleep. A place to cook and sleep and shit. A place to cook and sleep and shit and wash. A place to cook and sleep and shit and wash and love. A place to cook and sleep and shit and wash and love and study. A place to cook and sleep and shit and wash and love and study and dream. This place to be there when we return at twilight. This place to be there when my children are sick. What is a sin? I want to tell mama what they've done to me at church. But I fear hell, so I do not speak. When class is over. Aisha transfers her books into a backpack. She's already practicing. Practicing a life of walking the tightrope between a silence that chokes and a silence that will make believe it is a sanctuary. First year of varsity in a new city, while walking down the street alone, a man I do not know wordlessly grabs my breast as he passes. He doesn't stop, neither do I. I've always known this body is not mine alone. I think men only love my mouth when it is not moving, not saying no, not protesting, not biting, not screaming, not cursing, not saying no. I swear I said no, but who hears you when you have no mouth? She said no, so I hit her. I hit her again and she fell, so I kicked her, I kicked her again. And I want to know how that feels. Rage rises, fist in groin, torpedoes belly, pythons intestines, sprouts to wings like God's own angels, thunders bullets through hands of feet. I want to know what it takes to beat a woman to death. It is incredibly violent. And that is a demand we should make upon our state in the way we live our lives that we should not be living a life that is ordinarily violent and violent in the extreme. If the state is saying to us that if you've got the means, don't hold back, you know, shoot first, ask questions later, then, then what's to stop the average citizen from following suit? Through South Africa's history, violence is given as the singular option. And I think it's important for us to see alternatives to violence in constructing what a society can be. And those alternatives can come in the form of options, opportunities. And I think that the organizing that we need to do needs to be together in community rather than relying on um, colonial and violent structures like prisons, jails, and the government to protect us. Thomas Sankara, murdered leader of the 1980s revolution in Burkina Faso, is famously quoted as saying, Comrades, there is no true social revolution without the liberation of women. Although greater attention has been afforded to the war on women's bodies, 
one wonders how visible and heard women are in constructing themselves out of that war. She fought to escape the gaze of men who fuck her with their eyes, wants to climb out of their angry purity, wants to come out from behind the skin on their rigid faces. If only their eyes could vomit her onto any street corner or alley, she would make her way to dreams, to riding high, if only. To a black woman, a safe space might as well be a metaphor. She carries her body like an apology, turned inward from a gaze that is not her lover's. She is accustomed to the rise of the hairs on the back of her neck in response to the scent of danger in the wind, even in her wounded hour. Death could still be waiting on the other side of that door, knock, knock. In our mini skirts and our burkas, we sit on the mountaintop drafting obituaries, smiling to prevent falling into open graves, learning to breathe underground. But we are taught not to ask why our men are undertakers, <laughs> carrying spades between their legs, fists full of dust, why they are already dressed for funerals. We exist to be taken from the grocery store from our schools, from our beds. Our bodies do not belong to us. I'm known as Marokhavo, mother to my firstborn's name, known as Mrs. Mavie, wife of the family I married into, known as Mandela's wife. I'm commonly known by these names other than my own. Commonly Houdini, it's expected, it's cultural. They will say you are a woman when you sit at the table, say nothing, keep him full. His hands are buckets with the bottoms removed. And when his love lifts you into them, you will not realize that loving him will hurt you a long time. You will bow your tongue into your throat to make room for his words. Men raised on the sorrows of their mothers don't know how to love women or themselves. They're like the powers that starve us and then pretend to feed us. Love is not charity. It is not a celebrity photo op with orphans. Africa begs for her own riches and we turn into crumbs in each other's eyes like rats we bite and blow as we go. Will a generation of mothers apologize for how we've raised our sons? Will somebody accept responsibility under pressure she has taken strain my feminist friend this has not been a good time for us a chance meeting in a restaurant it had been years. Close once, we greet warmly. I move on. She returns to her conversation, and I see it. Stylish as always. Fire in her glancing eyes. Hands in motion. She is animated, engaged. But I see it. In the set of her mouth, the gleaming silver in her locks. Now even on those dark days, though the voices in your head will not agree, you are not defect, you are not damaged, you are not default, you are not sorry, and you should not be, you are miracle. You are harmony. I am more than a rock motherfucker. I'm a woman. I'm a bad bitch. I am a diva. I am Her Majesty the Queen. I am ugly. I am divine. I am crazy. I am fine. I am a W.O. man. I am a well-organized man. I am a woman. I am so hip. Even my errors are correct. I sailed west to reach east and had to round off the earth as I went. 
The hair from my head thinned and gold was laid across three continents. I am so perfect, so divine, so ethereal, so surreal. I cannot be comprehended except by my permission. I mean, I can't fly like a bird in the sky. The rape trial of Jacob Zuma. I think that was a turning point for many of us who could see the dire contradictions in our everyday life. But here was the direct contradiction laid out for us to see. I think for men in South African society, we need to ask ourselves to what extent are women's voices in our everyday discourse? And to what extent are we listening to the experiences of women? The optics look right, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that that symbolized any real rooted structural change in that these may just be women that are playing into male roles and that the roles themselves, the character, the nature of the positions that they are playing into have not changed and still symbolized very much the, 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 the patriarchy. And I think that if we're going to build another society that uh, women are not afraid in, that women are not devalued in, that women are, are celebrated in, then we need to start doing that work ourselves. Political leaders, especially those forged out of liberation movements, won the following of their people by removing conditions of governance that were inhumane. However, the cultures of governance that have taken root in place of the ones removed have become equally, if not more, questionable. Something is bothering me. Something is bothering me. Looks like you don't know. We all want people. Outsiders own our opportunities outside. <laughs> um, Basanjo's oil oozes outside. Processed, packaged, premium petroleum prices peak. Poor people produce. Prosperous people. Prosperous people process poor people's produce. <laughs> Proudly preaching, promoting prosperity principles. So we only come to you to be political and every couple of years to do political dance. Do we speak? No, we play political bands to distract the crowd from our political plans. And that steel is part of our political pact. I mean, everybody else does. It's a political fact. And my family needs these political stacks. That's why I keep up with this political act. In my land, they call it Nyawawa, and it's coming. It was the first to steal our trees and rains. Does it threaten our new pumpkin tendrils, that corruption? Chase it out like the people near Lake Victoria do to evil, beating their pots and pans overnight to chase it away, Nyawawa. Maybe the tea, the pots, and the plates of Dane Hayes are sweet. Maybe state house cocktails are blessed by the Archbishop of Habola Church. <laughs> Maybe there's bliss on earth and it lives in a fire pool. Maybe the stomach is overtaking the mouth. Maybe our children will turn the tables and curse the dazzling dresses we wear. Maybe the mirror is telling us lies. Maybe we are high flying creatures or trap and lost creepers. Maybe our get of fabulous gods will fall between the cracks of a nyaupe riot. Guide me in, privatize the sun, copyright the clouds, before the others come, those others, to steal our rainbows. From Johnny Diani and Commandante Hani, an era ends since then it's money, money, money.
They are too obsessed with the honey of money that stings the BEEs. It's no wonder our flag is forever asking why endlessly. Now, he reckons it's probably the immorality of society that these policies work only for the ones with big bellies, who stand behind podiums publicly, who speak proudly of their deeds, while our country is falling apart at the seams. With each cross you take, and all we get are broken promises, yeah. cheap t-shirts, or chore me on potbelly stages. Yeah. We get raped by our fathers, our homes get broken into, and still your taking never stops. No. We have sung your praises. Oh, we have filled your stadia. Mm. We have devoted our lives to you. So, damn it, I expect more from you. Yes, I'm AK-47. I know of a greater power, greater than me. The strength of the majority of the numerous numbers of the people as a community rising up in a defense militia to defend, every, to resist, every aggression of violence against the community and stepping on forward to organize as a class against the tiffin ruling class you work for me but i'm tired of seeing my countrymen bleeding for the sake of your fees see you work for me but I cannot believe in your incompetent grinning at my nation's needs. You work for me inadequately, selfishly stabbing our unity, spitting at the beauty and diversity, disrespectfully rubbing dirt in the wounds that it should be your duty to heal for our children's prosperity. Don't we drive on the same roads you'd rather take on loans or aren't you here too? You work for me. The work of critically interrogating one society can lead to an analysis of the situation as dire. However, the poetics of transformation does not call us to ruminate only on what is, but to be brave enough to believe that this is not it. We are invited to psychologically and physiologically reimagine ourselves and map our way to there. The liminal space of radical transformation. The underpinning rumbling of social justice. We need to hold ourselves to account when we don't respect others. And in so doing, do not respect ourselves. Maybe if we hold ourselves to account, we will reach a stage where the state accounts for the state's accounts. There is no lack and no war where the hundreds of years of coloniality have been unpicked and unraveled so that knowledge and learning and spirituality and ideas and voice is um, unbound from that violence of, of whiteness. I want to live in a country and I want to live in a world where I'm not in need of an armor of constant awareness, of constant vigilance, of constantly having to protect myself against not only the reality of impending violence, but the anticipation of it. I think absent those stresses, society would 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 advance in a yeah in a in a state of of real tangible.
of civilizations created hominid differences, hominid day, hominid nay, hominid knee, hominid na. We all walked South Africa. Hominid day, hominid nay, hominid knee, hominid na. From up in trees to down on ground. In upright ratio of leg took us from four into infinity. Hominid day, hominid nay, hominid knee, hominid na. One common mama. So far, so root. This message is human psychology. Anti-apocalyptology, a working towards collective memory, history, a giant forgetting of legacy, the mysteries, original African ingenuity, artistry of the tribe called humanity. Oh, we from Mama. Oh, we from Africa. Oh, we a legacy of stars coming and going from same source. A sea of faces, one face, a dark, spacious wave, all the way home, all the way home. There are no borders in the world. There is no distance between races, genders, nations, gods, and languages. Africa is the heart of the planet. Our resources feed the world. They always have. Our people, a kaleidoscope of color and ancestry, move freely. We are revered for holding the history of humanity. We are respected for what we have endured and contributed to the world. Ours is a story of transcendence. How to dive into the heart of pain to get to the bottom of the truth. How to walk with fear without being consumed by it. How to coexist with difference through self-respect and respect of the other. Who we are is embedded in all that we do and everything that originates from us. The world eats the flesh of our land adorns itself with our magical art and learns through our sciences and prospers through our understanding of humanity. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone. We're joined this evening after a Poetics for Transformation. I hope you all enjoyed the film. We're joined this evening by two of the filmmakers, Karen Ijumba and Daniel Sheldon. Uh, unfortunately, Sbo Kele will not be able to join us this evening. Um, he did sound as far as I understand. Um, Karen, you are a researcher, physical and digital archivist and uh, academic research project manager. So it makes sense that you were brought on to make this beautiful film. Uh, Karen holds an LLB and BA honors in heritage and public culture from the University of Cape Town and a master's in arts and cultural management from the University of Witwatersrand. She's based in Durban where she currently offers support to DUT's Urban Future Center. Um, and she's also focusing on growing her own storytelling and meaning making voice at the intersection of Africa, archives, art, and the digisphere in a circle of like minded knowledge, cultural, and creative workers. Welcome, Karen. We're joined also by Daniel Sheldon. He is the phenomenal artist, illustrator, animator, who is also a teacher and a musician. He was born in Zimbabwe in 77 and grew up in Durban. South Africa. Um, he completed a diploma in fine art at the Technicon of Natal before shifting into a career in music as a trumpet player. Um, and I guess as a result of COVID, um, as you mentioned, Daniel, in your bio, you've switched now to your original passion of illustration. So we can thank COVID for that. Um, at least it shows in your work and you've done an extraordinary job, both of you. I can't thank you. And the sound is beautiful. The music was stunning. I'm going to go to Karen first to speak about the project and working with all the archival footage and how it came to be. And then we'll go to you, Daniel. So Karen, please go ahead. Hi, Valma. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, and just to give some context to how it came about, I mean, Daniel and I are sitting here as kind of the representatives, but it's been a, a massive a team effort in terms of putting this project together. Um, but at the forefront of that, um, and somebody who had the foresight to put this together in his mind, first and foremost, a whole, like a whole year ago was Ishmael, 
um, Mohammed, um, who commissioned, um, who applied, sorry, for funding to look at the ways in which we could kind of intervene into this 24 year old arts archive of poetry Africa performances. Um, and so he designed a set of projects that he wanted to do, some with books, some with film. Um, and amazing, right? Um, so he had the foresight to do that. And we were lucky enough to be the, the team that were chosen to, to execute the task. Um, and so I did, I came on with my archival background. I've been interested in arts archives for a while and had approached yeah, him. Brilliant. Yeah, and he brought us on. Daniel had just won the Art Friends, uh, cartoon competition. Spo had been working with the center around the art friends, uh, project as well. And we were kind of put together and given room to play around with this idea of poetry, social justice, and then these very apparent ideas of, of social justice that live within the hashtag movements and just being given exactly. room to, to kind of figure out what that would look like in a filmic, um, in a filmic state. Um, and that's how it came about. And then poets joined in there. We got some poets, some who are deeply rooted in Durban. Um, Sarah's based in Johannesburg, and then Khabiba Baderun, who's Khabiba Baderun, um, also kind of kindly offered her voice to it. And then the musicians, Kanyo and Gulego, who are also very deeply rooted in the Durban art scene, kind of brought the whole thing together as well. And then Nathan Redpath just added his magic, and there we had it. <laughs> Amazing. That is yeah. really beautiful, Karen. Thank you for that background into the project. Um, Daniel, take us to your sketches, your drawings, and your animation, which so beautifully stitch all of these archival images together, you know, with the music and everything in the background. Please speak to us about that. Um, you just want, you might want to just unmute your mic for us, please. Sorry, Thank you. I wonder that. I say, yeah, uh, Karen got hold me after I won the art Fluence competition. Um, so Ishmael put us together. It was really, it was a kind of a project that came out of the blue for me. Um, I think, uh, um, right. Your art yeah. reminded me so much of, um, and please don't mistake me as not being South African. I am South African. I just have a Canadian accent. So I was whisked away in the 70s and grew up in Canada. So it reminds me a lot, your illustrations and artwork are very reminiscent of um, Telefilm Canada illustrated films and projects from way back when, like mm -hmm. in the 70s. And I love the feeling, you know, the way your illustrations have their own song because you are a musician and have their own movement. Um, your drawings and your illustrations really do help to meld the archival footage together. But please continue. You were you were saying something about your art. Uh, yeah, I was just saying that like uh, when I when I got the project, it was it was all the, the upheavals, the unrest, and um, um, sorry, I'm blanking out. Um, were you talking about you talking about the riots in? Um, Durban in June or no before that? Yeah, yeah, it was all that kind of stuff and then, and then COVID and sorry. My, yeah, I'm, and um, yeah. you usually work as a musician. Um, I mean, in your bio, you said you're a trumpeter and basically COVID, you know, did away with your career as a performing artist. Correct? I guess you used yeah. to play, used to play jazz gigs or Live music gigs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was working as a as a trumpet player in a jazz. Uh, I did a few jazz bands that I work with and stuff around. Fantastic. There. So yeah, it must have been quite shocking to suddenly a be without work. I can uh, attest to that because I work in the film industry and that was completely shut down for at least six months. Yeah. So what an amazing gift that you not only shift your work to illustration, and then win an award for an art fluence you know, human rights festival animation, and then get thrown into this project with Karen. That must have been quite something for you. Yeah, it was a bit of a shock. Uh, I actually enjoyed it though, because uh, like illustration and stuff, it was actually something that I've, that I've always been uh, passionate about. Um, since yeah, it's pretty, evident that, it's pretty evident that you're very good at it. I mean, it's very beautifully executed and Karen, you tell me what you think. I thought the way the drawings just appear to be so completely organic and natural and 
you know, just well matched to the footage that you chose. And clearly you did the archi archival selections. True. So I'll, I'll just speak to, in terms of working with Daniel, which was quite um, fun. So he was actually describing something to me the other day in terms of like, as an artist, you start to develop your hand to be able to draw certain things. So he'd lost that kind of rhythm in his arm. But as he started doing this project, he kind of refound it as well. And the fun thing about working with Daniel is like, you can give him an, an idea and it's like, he doesn't, he doesn't take it and then do it. He kind of just warps it in his mind and then throws it back at you in like this really psychedelic or like very like, like it's very disruptive or it's very like, it makes you start to think. And he puts so many things within those illustrations as well. But I think people are actually gonna have to watch this about three, four, five times to catch all the messaging that's actually so deeply rooted or deeply ingrained into the, the stuff that he does. So um, yo, it was, yeah, every single session that we had to sit down because we were working remotely most of the time to just watch those animations. You go sit down for a week and think about it and come back and be like, yo, Daniel, I thought I was telling you something. You're actually telling me a lot more. <laughs> so that was, will, pretty, yes. was yeah. I will, I'll agree with you there. There's a, a section in the film and, and I've only watched it twice now, but I will watch it again. And I even think it plays beautifully as a background soundtrack if you're doing something else and you're listening to the poetry and you come in and you look at the illustrations and you listen to the delivery because the footage is stunning. The mm -hmm. archival footage is beautiful and it's so very now, you know, I don't know how old those pieces are and um, the delivery is you know, I don't know if it's 20 year old footage or five year old footage, but it's as though it was delivered today. Yeah. So it was it was very well selected. And one of the points in the drawings that I thought was very beautiful is, you know, we all live with so much razor wire, which I have to tell you, I really can't stand. And I think it should be abolished. It's such a terrible thing. And your drawings of the razor wire and the barbed wire and the way it integrates and weaves into vines and you know, and then during one delivery and then you quickly snuck a few flowers in there. You know, when there's another solution, there could be another solution. You know, then the then the, the razor wire turns into a plant, turns into flowers, turns into a vine. Yeah, the so, trick is actually the trick is actually not getting too literal, you know, when you when you do these kind of things. There's uh, like a visual um, visual cues are so kind of broad but also like like it's an emotional language you know like exactly the well exactly about. i mean if you weren't watching closely you wouldn't tell that that's what was going on because just little dots of color you know little flowers little it's it's very quick but i think yeah. that's what karen was speaking to and i think that was really beautiful i mean your illustrations are super stunning and could be watched you know on silent but clearly as i mentioned even the poetry no, delivered no, no, no. You know, it's just beautiful to see the two of them melded together so beautifully. And honestly, when I wrote to you this morning, I was not joking. The first time I watched the film, I literally wept through the whole thing. Yeah, that's cool. But it, it's Very not just it's one element. There's a whole lot of elements and everything. I, even Karen will, will attest. Like when we when we'd watch all the pieces like separately, That'd be that'd be cool, but as soon as you added like even the music in its raw in its raw state, it just like everything kind of flowered. And when when Spore put like linked everything up uh, with the video editing, it's like everything flowered again, you know. And when we add the when we add the voiceovers, everything kind of the meaning shifts. So it's well, not. Yeah, I think this I mean, really. You can say it it, it it would work silently, but I, I promise you it doesn't. <laughs> Work no, I'm, I, I don't suggest that the, the whole poetry delivery mm. works silently, but what I mean is each aspect of the delivery would work as a standalone. Yeah. You know, the music alone, the visuals alone, the poetry delivered alone. Um, In I fact, think a lot of this stuff was kind of accidental because like what I was trying to say earlier on before I um, lost my track, was that uh, like with COVID and, and, and with, the, with the looting and that, there was like a breakdown. It was hard to communicate, you know, because we were also separate. So, and we're trying to send files to each other and yes. have a discussion on Zoom, which is breaking down and files are not yes. playing properly or not playing in time. Exactly, um, exactly. But like, so like when we started off the project, we weren't all like quite sure of, of kind of the direction we were each going in, you know? 
So right. I was just like using drawings and animations and like, and then, and then towards the middle of the project, we started finding like a spot for them. So it wasn't, it was almost like, uh, like it was a bit more abstract and kind of made it a bit more beautiful, I think, as well. Yeah. That things weren't, like I said, literal, you know? Yeah. So I guess, I mean, Ishmael's Dr. Mohammed speaks very often about working in silos. And, you know, COVID has forced us all to be isolated to a degree, um, even though we have this beautiful capacity to connect virtually it still lacks the physical closeness, right? And the emotional engagement that we get when we're with people. So yeah. yes, it must have been quite challenging for all of you to work independently, individually, and then get together online to exchange information, files, uh, feedback. I imagine towards the end of the project, you probably did get to work together. Was that the way it went? Yeah, kind of in, in, in bits and pieces, eh, Corin? Yeah, it was in bits and pieces. I think the first, we'd done a lot of stuff online together. So via like we had our weekly meetings and check-ins just to see what was going on. But there literally came a point where Daniel and Smo were like, no, we actually have to meet physically because we need to look at this thing together and be able to point. And, you know, there was some, there's some things that can be replaced with remote work, but there's some things that like your energy just needs to be able to match in the same space. Um, but we did, I think about maybe three of those in the space of five months. So remote can work, but I think you can never replace the connection that happens when you sit together looking at something and all your senses are involved in terms of curating what's going on in front of you. Um, mm. But those, those are the more fun ones where we could like come together and you know interject and be able to say, no, shift this there, shift this here, um, where you kind of felt the creative process flowing through your whole body. Um, but yeah, but remote, we got stuff done. We got stuff done in, in the time that we needed to get it done. <laughs> yeah, also people had like individual freedom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a good balance, yeah. I think. Yeah. Even yeah. Well, you know, that, that, is, and, uh, that is actually an interesting um, format. You know, everyone working independently and then sort of weaving it all together when it comes together mm -hmm. so that you all connect independently and individually with the work through your you know in your own organic way and then you bring it forward when you get together and mix it all up i suppose it's very similar to music would it not be daniel when people write music they often write separately and come together and jam and mix it up and figure out how it's going to be yeah it's like playing with a good band where we've got a good band and the music comes out together the bass is doing their function and everything else can kind of support on top of that the drums does their function exactly Exactly. So I suppose for you working, I suppose for you working in this capacity is very similar to what you used to do in music. Yeah, actually, the, like the other thing that's similar is, is collaborating with other artists. Um, mm. So like from different from different fields, you know, because I mean, the arts is all it's all about the same the same kind of thing. Poetry, dance, uh, theater, um, uh, music, art, illustration. It's all it's all like the same kind of well, vernacular, you know? Yes, I would agree with you. And I would even go so far because I often have this kind of discourse with scientists. You know, a lot of scientists and people in technology don't think they're artists. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I lived with a guy who was an atomic physicist. And frankly, I think scientists are crazy. I think they're complete artists. You know, they're like mad painters or composers or writers. And they don't actually think of themselves as creative per people which I'm Didn't certain, you? yeah, I'm certain people in medicine and science and all that as well, they may not think they have the creative flair of an artist, but this is why multidisciplinary work is so important. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Karen, you're an, you're an archivist and you're yeah. a professional, you know, sort of documentarian, right? You, you go through documents, you make sure that they're archived in the correct way and you're a cultural archivist. So yeah. These are very specific skills. It's not like you're a painter or a dancer or a poet, mm. but in this instance, you are. Yeah. Now that was, so funny enough, I am a poet. <laughs> <laughs> but in my earlier days, in my younger days, but my professional profile is to be an archivist. Like I work on computers with Excel spreadsheets. That's like what I do. Or I dig through like, I've largely with like colonial archives. 
but to bring that across to an art space was quite interesting and it also be able to I don't know, let go of some like the more rigid rules that are understood from, from an archivist side to get into the more fluid motion of actually creating. Um, yeah. I think the team was such a good balance of like, no, you need to let that go. You need to be more strict about this. Like if it was time or things like that, that we had to kind of give each other space to do certain things. So it was it was a learning curve trying to exercise the different um, a different muscle. Um, but I think what was fun for me about this was being able to, to go and have conversations with poets that I've never necessarily met in a physical space. Um, to have that length and breadth of like 10 to 15 years of, of poetry performances. So in this, yeah, in this documentary, you only see like 43 of the clips. I think in that process of the first month and a half, we picked about maybe like 350 clips that we then had to like, squashed Stop down to 43 yeah. yeah so that that process of looking over and listening being like oh my gosh you know resonating finding that other people are, are speaking or have been speaking about the stuff that's sitting in your heart but they were speaking exactly. about it in like yeah in like 2008 <laughs> but exactly. it still resonates now yeah it's so going through that process yeah and then being but, able to to give that back to somebody in the year 2021 i think that for me was just like you it's mind. It's it, it's a bit problematic that our world is still the same, but exactly. <laughs> it's I was going to better. say, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say it's actually very problematic if you consider that we are listening to poets who spoke maybe twenty years ago, ten years mm -hmm. ago, five years ago, and yet they're saying exactly the same things. Yeah, yeah. We are still yeah. discussing whether women are heard, gender equity you know, violence against women, we are still talking about the power of sexuality and the lack of clarity around where a woman ends and a man begins, you know. And besides all the other things that we were faced with, you know, fees must yeah. fall and Zuma must fall and pay back the money and all the mm -hmm. corruption and the Maracana scandal. I mean, we have lived through some things. Yeah, things is a sure. very polite way of putting it. Yeah, here in Africa, <laughs> we have lived through some things and your selections of poetry were quite, you know, they were quite uh, riveting and emotional because they speak to all of these wounds, all of these broken promises, all of these decaying social morals and the lack of justice, you know, here we are, 2021, what happened? 1994, what happened? We all know what we're living with. We still see the division of, the unequal division of assets every day. And that's tough. So I commend you. Um, this is a brilliant project. It is absolutely beautiful. I hope to see it many, many more times. And I'm sure we will show it at diff we can we'll show it around we'll definitely um give it its worth yeah i mean what's next for both of you um daniel would you like to speak to what's on your plate have you got another project on the go uh i've got another project which i need to start uh we're working on this one so intensively that i didn't get a, a chance to um but it's also uh doing some animations with um to some of the poetry that's coming out. Uh, I, think, I think it's current stuff. Okay, so, with some of the current know, poets that were in the, in the festival now. I, um, I'm not sure, I haven't, I haven't listened to it all properly, but there's a few, there's a few projects inside there that need to be animated. Um, Gorgeous. Uh, animating to a whole poem, like some of the some oh. that's quite. So, that's so beautiful. beautiful. I'm looking forward to that. Well, so are we, because I mean, this has been an extraordinary experience, Poetry Africa Live you know, on the web. And it gives us all the capacity to engage with poets without having, not that I would, I would rather be there physically, clearly, but um, your work's great. And I really hope that we get to see more animated poems from you. Oh, great. I've also got some, some music videos and stuff as well that are kind of in the... In the Good. In the, and, in you the... know, if you ever need to come and do some jazz gigs, you just need to jump down to Cape Town because there's loads of jazz gigs going on here. Is it a eh? loads? Loads, loads. So, Karen, what's next for you? 
um, what's next for me um, is still to continue these kind of interventions into the arts archive. Um, but I just want to, to pause on kind of the introduction that was given to say that, I mean, this is the first experiment with the stuff that's in the archive. It was done by three people who were brought together within like a short space of time. But my gosh, like the, the space that there is for, I don't know, a myriad of people to go in there, to look around, to push out stuff and to create is so, the potential for it is so massive. And so the, the one thing that I hope is taken away from this is that it's not a once-off thing. And this is not the only thing that can come out of that, that collection. Exactly. Like there's so much more. There's content from Time of the Right to there's content from Jamba. That's Yay. that all that can be, you know, re, re, revisited and retold in so many different ways. So I Beautiful. hope that the, the core thing that everyone takes away from this is that, oh, I want to try to do this in there and then be brave enough to come forward and say, can I, can I, can I make an attempt to do that? If we've been able Wonderful. to do that, then I think we've done, we've done good. <laughs> well, I, I think you're absolutely right. Thank you for that because, you know, giving, um, giving praise to poets, artists, writers, um, dancers who have come before, building a strong archive for our own, for posterity and for upcoming artists, for young artists. I think this is absolutely imperative. You know, perhaps people don't know because they're 20 years old and they've only started mm -hmm. studying dance. So maybe they're not familiar with all the great dancers who, you know, graduated in the 60s or 70s or choreographers. So I think this is a brilliant way to not only archive and uh, create a repository of information, but it's almost a necessity for the survival of artists. And it's also, as you know, because you're a cultural archivist, it's also essential to show the importance of art and the impact on culture. And it's pointless having an archive if it just sits in a box. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. And this is it the thing. Even, used. <laughs> yeah. And even, you know, that's the difficulty with archives is often they are just a bunch of dusty shelves and boxes that nobody accesses, as you know, except mm -hmm. academics. And, you know, we need to have, this is a brilliant project because it brings that to the forefront. And it means that in that whole resource, there is a possibility to reframe, reformulate, reposition, you know, and build something. Not much has changed. Sorry, well, you know, <laughs> it's, at least, it's at least imperative to start the dialogue. And even if we come to the conclusion that not much has changed, um, we need to celebrate what was said then and how, how many people have stood for the same cause you know, so that we can build that argument to move forward. I just think it is an amazing project. I thank you again for all the brilliant work you did. Give props to all the other people who worked with you. I'm sure you had a very big group of people participating. And uh, I hope to meet you sometime in Durban, in person. Yes, yeah. too. Please come. Creative don't, Art. Steal, don't steal Daniel away. You must come. No, time. I won't <laughs> steal him to Cape Town. No, no, no. He will stay there. Don't you worry. I'm the one who's coming to Durban. Fantastic. That, welcome. Yeah. welcome. <laughs> On that note, I'd like to thank you both. And I would like to thank our generous sponsors, uh, UKZN, KZN Department of Arts and Culture, the French Institute of South Africa, and Total Energies. Most importantly, I'd like to thank you, Karen and Daniel, for this amazing project and wish you all the best on the upcoming future projects. We look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you. And a shout out to Svo, who is recording tonight. We also Beautiful. appreciate you for your fantastic precision and stitching everything together. Thank you exactly. so much. Exactly. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Daniel. Great to meet you both. All right. Have a great evening. Bye. You too. Bye.